Lula. Good evening. We want to thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Lula Woodard and I'm one of the members of Women of Colors and the prevention team as well. And this evening, I wanna take the opportunity to say a prayer because boy, do we ever need prayer. In these times, we really need prayer. So right now, Father God, in the mighty matchless name of Jesus Christ, we come, Father God, thanking you for who you are and who we are becoming in and through you and out of you on this evening, Father God. We thank you for this day that you have made. And so we will rejoice and be glad in it. And again, you said we will rejoice and be glad in it. And so Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to come to this platform that has been provided for us in the name of Jesus Christ, to be a blessing to our community, oh Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, to, to, uh, to bring peace, to bring glory, in these times, Father God, because we're living in turbulent times. And so we know that we need peace. So I pray for peace, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, that will guide us, that will direct us in our homes, in our schools, in our communities, in the name of Jesus. And I pray for every panelist that is on this forum tonight, Father God, that you will give them clarity as they speak, oh Father God, in the name of Jesus, that you will bless Evelyn and Vicki, our board members of Women of Colors, oh Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, for that, we will give you glory because we know that you do all things well. You're the creator and we're the creator, created of all things. And so for that, we give you glory. For that, we give you honor. And for that, we truly, truly, truly give you praise on this evening. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. 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 Thank you so much for joining us tonight for another forum. Good evening. Yeah. It's a wonderful day, a great day that the Lord has made, right? So yes, tonight I am hosting, actually co-hosting with our president, Miss Evelyn McGovern. Hello. Hello, everyone. <laughs> So I'm going to give you a little bit of information about women of colors just before we get this form started. Tonight, you will hear some inspirational stories from three young ladies who are going to tell us about the struggles of life that they've gone through and how they overcame. But before we get there, I'm going to give you a little bit of information about women of colors. Women of Colors has become such a staple in our community, doing some great work. Women of Colors is an independent nonprofit organization that has been active in the, in the community as a partner since the inception of 1993. The organization was developed with a diverse group of women sharing their ideas to improve Saginaw community. Women of Color recognizes the strength of diversity by not focusing on our differences, but acknowledging our similarities. Members and volunteers provide empowerment and quality educational programs. Women of Color's mission promotes multicultural diversity and enhances the community relations in the Great Lakes Bay region. In 2002, Women of Color's developed a great empowering motivational sessions. It's a youth mentoring program that consists of multiple youth mentoring programs to encourage the community service and teach social and life skills to develop young men and women of excellence. We also put on an annual Women's of Color Scholarship Fund to give to opportunities to well-deserving students in the Great Lakes Bay region. In 2015, we helped to establish the Student and Future Technology Program, also <clears throat> known as SAF. It's a program with science advisor Richard Springfield to help stretch students' understanding and the ability to uh, their current knowledge of science and new technology. Women of Colors collaborates with area schools, churches, businesses, agencies, and other organizations to make a difference and Women of Color spends countless hours to enrich the culture of volunteerism and service that makes the Saginaw community a great place for individual families to work, have fun, and live. That's Women of Colors. Women of Colors also in 2017 developed and hosted our first How I Overcame. 
And then we took on I'm Still a Man. This event for, is for men and women, and they're telling their personal stories of how they overcame their challenges to become successful and productive in this society. That's what Women of Colors does. Oh, thank you, Vicki. You're welcome. Well, awesome. And so again, my name is Evelyn McGovern, and I'm one of the co-founders of Women of Colors. And I am currently the president of Women of Colors. And I want to welcome you and thank you to each and every one of you for joining us today. We are excited to welcome those of you who have been with us for a long time now and those who are new to joining us today. I also want to especially thank our panelists for accepting Women of Colors' invitation to speak this evening. It takes a lot of courage to talk about yourself. I believe no one can tell your story like you can. Today marks Women of Color's fifth annual forum, and we are proud to be able to host it today on this platform that includes KISS 107, WSGW, The Moose, WGER, and Women of Color's own Facebook page. So I want to remind you too that there's a short survey that we need you to, to, to complete either doing or after the form. Please complete that survey. It helps us support this program. So again, I want to thank you for your time. And I want to I want to introduce you to the host, my, me and my co-host, Vicki Hill. And just to give you their names, Tyra Napoleon, Amanda Forsmark, and Cynthia Hatcher. And I'm I'm going to introduce our first co um, our first speaker, and let me um, I'm going to read you her bio as soon as I give me a second here. All right. So I just want you to sit back and relax and enjoy this evening. I'm sure you're going to get a lot out of what each one of the ladies have to say this evening. So Tyra. Takaira, I'm sorry, Napoleon, is a diversity, equity, inclusion practitioner with over 10 years of experience. She has experience building mutually beneficial business partnerships as well as community partnerships. She's led both students and professional staff members, promoting accountability and awareness around diversity, inclusion, and belonging, driving employees' engagement, and diversity, equity, and inclusion in hiring practices. Her journey of diversity, equity, and inclusion started as a freshman at the University of Michigan in 2010 through intergroup relations. This program taught her to start self-reflecting on her identities and how to help navigate others through their self-identification process. After Graduation in 2013, she began working in student affairs for University of Michigan. She spent years in implementing their train the trainer curriculum for student affairs professionals, revamping their internal onboarding processes to promote inclusivity division wide. Division wide. Kyra served on the diversity and hiring council training others on search committee practices and unconscious biases in hiring, and also developed training for a 12-week program around identity and building inclusive environments for residents, advisors in the University of Michi Michigan dorm. She earned her Master's of Science in Human Resources and Organizational Development from Eastern Michigan University in 2015 where she learned the ins and outs of training, staffing, recruiting. She previously worked as a corporate financial services learning and talent development specialist for the Michigan State University Federal Credit Union. There she developed and implemented diversity, equity, and inclusion learning curriculum courses such as managing personal biases, Exploring identities, authentic, authenticity, 
authenticity, I'm sorry, I can't say the word right now, in, in the workplace, managing discriminatory harassment and promoting change. She has served as the first full-time equity and inclusion officer for the state of Michigan's Department of Technology Management and Budget since March two, 2021. In this role, she is a member of the senior leadership team and leads the department's diversity, equity, and inclusion committee efforts. In her free time, Kyra volunteers with the Big Brothers Big Sisters program, and she enjoys finding new ways to explore the lasting area. Authenticity. I couldn't think of that word, but I got it now. <laughs> so I'm just glad to have Kyra here to share her story, whatever that may be. The good, the bad, the ugly, whatever that is. Ah, oh, that was a that was an awesome bio. I tell you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to everyone today. I appreciate Miss Evelyn for giving you that introduction and that biography. Um, and I'm just excited to kind of tell you a little bit more about how I got to those positions and through those positions um, through my lifetime. So. I remember when I read the instructions and heard that we were going to be talking for about 20 minutes, I was like, I can't talk about my experiences for 20 minutes. But after writing this and timing myself, I was definitely wrong. So I'm going to make sure I keep it under 20 minutes and also leave time for questions as well. So over the last 12 years, I've experienced a lot of rejection. My mom always taught me to believe Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. She encouraged me to go for opportunities and choose things even when they were hard. Although I have a solid foundation, people would really have me questioning myself sometimes. The first experience that comes to mind is with my guidance counselor in high school. I remember telling them my plans to apply to several universities. University of Michigan, Michigan State University, and Central Michigan University, to name a few. The response I received was, well, maybe you should aim a little lower to start off with, perhaps a community college. I wanna pause here and acknowledge that there's 100% nothing wrong with community colleges. In fact, community colleges are an excellent opportunity and option for many reasons. A few include helping students ease into the world of higher education and learn at their own pace, offering flexibility for students, and costing way less money than universities. That being said, I also know that the nation's system of higher education is growing more racially polarized even as it attracts more minorities. White students increasingly are clustering at selective institutions while people of color are mostly attending open access and community colleges. These paths offer widely unequal opportunities in some situations, which leads to widely unequal outcomes. I also know for a fact that she wasn't telling everyone in my class to apply for community college. All of that being said, I continued to apply to the schools that I was interested in without being persuaded by the comment that my counselor made. I remember senior year, everyone was asking questions about where people were applying to. Some people will offer me a lot of encouraging words and others made the same comment that my counselor made, but I knew that where I was meant to be, I would be. I got accepted into college, each college that I applied for. I remember my assistant principal telling me to continue to soar and a good friend of mine's parents giving me a permanent marker that said, make your mark. These words stuck with me as I was entering into college. I chose the University of Michigan, go blue, and although it wasn't my top choice initially, I loved it. Prior to heading to U of M, I remember telling people where I'd be heading to in the fall and being asked, oh, Dearborn or Flint? Again, we're all under the same umbrella, but I can guarantee that my white counterparts weren't being asked that same question. I even asked them to be sure. And whenever I would say Ann Arbor, the look of shock on people's faces said everything. 
I changed my major more times than I can count when I got to the University of Michigan. And both my academic advisor and my mom provided support through each change. They'd always tell me to think about what my long-term goals and aspirations were and what it was that I liked to do. As an 18-year-old, that is a hard question. There are a lot of things that I wanted to do, which was apparent by my major changing so often. My mom encouraged me to look into intergroup relations, which was talked about in my bio. For those of you who are unfamiliar, intergroup relations blends theory and experiential learning. This com combination facilitates learning about social group identity, social inequity, and the way that people interact with others. The program prepares students to live in workplaces and live in a diverse world that educates them while making choices that advance equity, justice, and peace. This program changed my life. I learned more about my identities and the way that I show up in the world. This changed the game for me. I reflected back on past experiences and realized that the offensive things people said weren't personal. Those people were just operating from their limited lens of experiences. This program also taught me about oppression that I might face based off of certain parts of my identity and also about privileges that I would gain because of certain parts of my identity. I started to see almost everything from a social justice education lens and an opportunity to really think about the impact our identities have on the work that we do and the world that we live in. Ever since I took that class and the multiple classes in the department throughout my college experience, I've seen the world differently. At this time, I was interested in psychology. I started to think about the role that social justice issues played in psychology and mental health and mental illnesses. That work was exhausting. I have respect for and send good vibes to anyone who is in that field, especially the ones that are looking at it through a justice lens because the work is difficult and draining. I realized that with my newfound knowledge, I was going to have to find meaningful work that allowed me to still incorporate social justice education while also being able to go home and sleep at night without feeling 100% defeated. My junior year, I took an organizational psychology class. This taught me about the science of how people think and behave at work. It was marketed as a field that helps both people and organizations. I remember getting a C in that class, but I loved it so much and was very invested. I wanted to learn more about how to do that work and also use my social justice background to enhance the work. Around this time, things were smooth sailing. I was in my junior year. I'd finally figured out what it was I wanted to do and how that could connect my passion of social justice education um, and I was also about to graduate soon, which was, of course, a big plus for me. I finished up and graduated, and it was a whole new world. My work-study job ended a couple days after graduation. I was still working at Costco part-time, and I didn't have any jobs lined up. I was applying nonstop and not hearing back from any of those jobs. I decided to do the easiest thing at the time, which was go back to school. This time, I decided to get my master's in human resources and organizational development at Eastern Michigan. Go Eagles. While I was cashiering at Costco, I ran into a woman who I worked with at my work study job. We had some small talk and she asked me what I was up to. I told her I was back in school for my master's and expressed my struggle with finding a job. She told me that a place that she was working was hiring and she encouraged me to apply. She had mentioned that it was a front desk job, but at least it was something that I could do while I was still looking for an opportunity and to have some more income. I applied and got a job at the Ginsburg Center. The Ginsburg Center was a place I was familiar with as I had done work there during undergrad. Ginsburg is a community and civic engagement center that has a mission to cultivate and steward equitable partnerships between communities and the University of Michigan to advance social change. Part of this work included working with students to help them think about their identities and how they show up during community engagement. If the work around identity sounds familiar, that's because it is. That's similar to the work that I was doing in intergroup relations four years prior. Although I was a front desk 
staff member, it was interesting to me to see how I was placed in a building that valued the work that I was interested in. Long story short, I ended up getting two promotions and staying at Ginsburg for about five years, but not without rejection and adversity. For example, I found out later that when I applied for my first role after being a front desk staffer, my then manager doubted my ability to perform the job, even though I had been doing the work already. This was bec because of the fact that I was young and had just finished college without formal experience. Thankfully, I had people advocating for me and willing to speak to my work ethic and allow me to obtain the job. After completing my master's degree with my ma manager's help, I began looking for a career that would help me get into the field that I was striving for. It was a lengthy process. Oop, it looks like the sun's going down, so I'm getting a little glow, so I apologize about that. Um, but it was a lengthy process with a lot of no's, but I learned and grew through the rejection. Each time I received a no, my manager would help me find another opportunity in our department to boost my resume. I landed my previous job in 2018, and I was finally given the opportunity to get into the field of human resources by becoming a learning and talent development specialist. This job allowed me to look at the needs of employees and create opportunities to address those needs. It was a great part of organizational development that I was able to love and enjoy. As part of this organization, I was able to create an African-American employee resource group, be a part of other resource groups that were created, and develop our first diversity, equity, and inclusion learning journey. Last May, when George Floyd was murdered and organizations were shifting their focus to more diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, I was able to speak to senior leadership about some of the inequities in our processes at the organization. I also was able to push back and challenge ways of thinking and offer solutions to common problems that were being brought up. I helped co-host a racial injustice forum and became seen as someone employees could reach out to and connect to to process questions and experiences around social identities. I was finally doing a sliver of the organizational development slash psychology work mixed with identity awareness and development that I knew I wanted to do years ago. When the conversation about our first diversity, equity, and inclusion director started, I was contacted by the person who was overseeing the role. She said, based on her observations of me and my previous background, she wondered if I'd be interested in doing the work full time. Of course, I said yes. She said she thought I'd be a great fit and encouraged me to connect with our chief of human resources. I connected with my manager first and the chief of human resources, who was actually my manager's manager, and we talked through it. Everyone agreed that my experience and background made me a great candidate for the role. I made it to the final interviews, or the final round of interviews, and I didn't get the job. I was devastated. I asked for feedback, and most of it was very surface level. The one that hurt me the most was that I should have worn a jacket during the interview process from the woman who told me to apply. Come to find out, they hired someone with very little experience in diversity, equity, and inclusion but a lot of experience in formal management. I couldn't understand why this perfect opportunity had slipped away from me. I remember developing my music playlist to help me get through the days, and I had faith that what was coming was better than what had happened to me. However, I'm a firm believer that faith without works is dead. I decided to sulk, not to sulk in the disappointment of rejection, but to update my resume and apply for jobs to go where I was valued for my gifts. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, Romans 8 and 28. Although the whole verse is powerful, the word purpose sticks out to me. It took me back to my mom and academic advisor asking me what it was that I wanted to do and who I wanted to be. I wrote that out while I was searching for jobs and let it inform my cover letters. Six months later, I got an offer for my current job at the state of Michigan as an equity and inclusion officer. I get the opportunities to do all of the things I mentioned in this story to you, all around identity development, social justice education, and organizational psychology and development. 
The question for today's talk is, how did I overcome? I know I started this talk saying that I felt like in the last 12 years, they were full of rejection for me. But the bright side of that is those rejections led me to better opportunities. Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. This has always been a favorite scripture of mine, but little did I know this was the guiding scripture for my life. Church has been a regular part of my life, especially growing up, and my faith is the rock on which I still stand. I try to remember this scripture when things don't go my way and remember that he is guiding me, not me alone. I also have an amazing support system. In the stories that I mentioned about rejection, the theme that sticks out to me most are the people that were there for me. The people who gave me a word of encouragement, opened a door for me, gave me resources, put a spark in me, or helped me and supported me in figuring out who I am and whose I am. My mom specifically has been my biggest support system for doing all of these things and more and will always be my best friend. Lastly, I go to therapy. When we have a lot of experiences of pain and rejection, it becomes easy to internalize those. The internalization can eat us up and cause us to forget our self-worth. Having someone to talk to and redirect energy and focus is helpful. This process has helped me to uncover pieces of myself that I didn't even know were covered. I practice my affirmations frequently and find ways to pour into my cup so that I can continue to pour into others. While rejection was my theme, the more I reflected, the more I realized how most of these experiences happened because of a bias that someone else had, which is exactly what I'm trying to combat through my work. So if you're listening and you feel like you've been counted out based on any of your identities or the way that you show up in the world, my advice is that you continue to be you. Challenge other people's ways of thinking. One way that I do that is by keeping questions like, what did you mean when you said X, Y, and Z? Or tell me more about why you feel that way in my back pocket. This opens up a dialogue and allows people the opportunity to do reflection on the words that they've said and the impact that their actions have had. If nothing else, it gives them a chance to stop and think before they say something else based to someone on their biases. Thank you for listening to my story. And if we have any more time left, I'd love to answer questions if people have any. Takaira, that was wonderful. I really enjoyed your story. That was Thank absolutely you. amazing. And you know what? You quoted my favorite scripture, Philippians 4 and 13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. I love that scripture. And that's one that I live by as well. I, I love what you said about your um, about your schooling. Let me ask you a question, though. As a Black woman in America, and even the men that are listening today, what is most important to you about diversity? I think that, you know, you mentioned this a little bit earlier about how sometimes we look at the differences that we have and we let that separate us, right? The importance of diversity is really the opportunity for us to look at both similarities and differences and how that impacts the environment that we're living in. Based off of those different identities that we have, we're able to come together and create something very special and very meaningful in the world. So I think that, you know, we need representation in all different types of areas, whether it's work, school, our life in general, just so that we can continue to enhance, you know, our knowledge and uh, enhance our experiences just as people in general. Absolutely. That was a great answer. You know, a lot of times if we would look past the color of our skin, then we could see that we have so much more in common. Even if we're not the same color, we have a lot of things that are very similar to each other. You know, a lot of times I think we need to learn each other's cultures. If we learn each other's cultures, then we begin to understand why this group of people does this, that group of people does that. Do you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that those differences in culture. So I used to approach it in a way where I'm like, 
well, I want to see all the things that we have in common, because once we see the things we have in common, we're able to continue to navigate the world, you know, in a straight path or whatnot. Um, and I was challenged on that thinking and told, you know, those differences are just as important because those are what, you know, helps us to understand why people behave the way that they do. So absolutely, absolutely agree. Absolutely. What would you say to a person? Um, what would you say to someone who says, um, how can we change? How can we add diversity in the workplace? And now, listen, I was, I was, I was asked a question and the question was, um, I was really surprised when I got the question, but the question was, what do we do? How do we change our workplace? How do we add diversity into this workplace? What would you say to a person that says that to you? I would say that they need to take a step back and think about the other pieces of the work, right? So a lot of times diversity seems like the easy way to bring in representation, to bring in different perspectives. And while all of that is great, you have to have a workplace that is going to be sustainable for people that are different, right? And so thinking about the, the inclusion, how are you making people that do not fit the norm feel included in the workplace? How are you making sure your policies and procedures are equitable and people have room for growth when they're in your organization? So really thinking about if I could, I would change the order and make it equity, inclusion and diversity, because I think that's the order that, you know, is going to help people have sustainable DEI practices. Um, I think with that inclusion and with that equity piece, you automatically will start bringing in diversity because you're going to be getting people that want to work for an organization that values that. Absolutely. And it was really surprising to me that they thought that what they were doing was perfectly fine and that they had diversity and inclusion in the workplace. But little did they know it really wasn't there. So mm -hmm. how would you how would you how would you begin to teach? Because I know that this is a part of your teaching. You talked about it in your in your talking there in your story. How would you begin to teach on diversity? What would you say and how to bring that in to the workplace? My first and I think most important, you know, talking point would be around making sure that you're listening to the stories of the employees that you have making sure that you're learning more about the, the cultures that people are a part of, making sure that you're learning more about the struggles or um, the, the areas that they're not succeeding in or thriving in, making sure that you're listening to those and not only getting that information, but doing something with it in order to make sure that we're promoting, you know, a, an, an inclusive, equitable and diverse um, environment. Absolutely. And it's one thing to get that information, but then they have to actually put it into action. It makes it doesn't matter if you get the information and you do nothing about it, but you've got to go a step further. You've got to put it into action in order for it to work. Am I right? You are absolutely correct. And I think that that accountability piece is huge because a lot of times employees, especially marginalized employees or employees of color or any other identity where we are in the minority group, um, a lot of us are tired of filling out the surveys and answering the questions and not seeing any change. So it really is important to hold leaders accountable and make sure that you know, we're, we're telling them, hey, we're answering these questions, but we're not noticing any change. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. I Thank you. you. So Evelyn is muted right now, and I don't think she knows that she is, and she's talking. Miss Evelyn? I'm sorry. You're right. I was talking. Oh, my goodness. So I have one question to Kyra. So in your bio, you talked about how you first learned um, about self-reflecting and self-identification and the process. Could you talk about, can you give us some pointers on that self-reflection? Yes. Yeah. So we all started off um, in that class with a social identity wheel, which really is just a spreadsheet that has all of the identities that make up people. So whether that's race, ethnicity, gender, 
sexual orientation, religious status, socioeconomic status, all of those identities or pieces that make us who we are. We filled that out and we just talked about it. We talked about when was the first time that you realized you were a part of this uh, community? What identities hold privilege for you? Which ones hold oppression? And that was a really eye-opening experience for me. They had us do these testimonials um, in the first class and talk about the area that is the most important to us, but then talk about the experience that led us to know that we were a part of that group. So I chose okay. being black and talked about that. And it was, you know, it was just an opportunity for us to really think about those identities that we have in a way that we probably hadn't thought of it before. Okay, awesome, awesome. I can send you that sheet if you want it. Oh yes, I do. Thank you. You're <laughs> Thank welcome. You. You're, you're, <laughs> there, there is a question that's um, on Facebook right now. It says, do you think that the dominant culture will begin to accept today's DEI as we want change? I think that's a good question. Um, I think that a lot of people have started that process. And I think that it's difficult to go through the process, right? Especially when you're in the norm or you're in the dominant group. Um, a lot of the systems that are in place, you didn't do anything to create those or you didn't make it the way that it was. And so some of the, the conversations we have about diversity, equity, and inclusion feel like attacks on the dominant culture and they don't realize that it's not personal. Like this is a system that is in place. Um, I think that a lot of people are trying to accept it and starting to ask questions and figure out ways. Uh, but I do think that it's going to take time because this has been something that's been been in place for many decades, years, you know, et cetera. Perfect. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kyra, for sharing. All right. So we're gonna move right along then. And our next speaker will be Amanda Forsmark. Amanda grew up in Flushing, Michigan, just outside of Flint. She has one younger brother, Travis. She attended Genesee Christian School for K through 12 and was salutatorian of her senior class. She was an active in sports, including being in the only girl, being the only girl on the varsity boys baseball team and in student council. She attended U of M Flint for both her bachelor's degree, human biology and master's degree, health education. While at University of Michigan Flint, she was involved in Greek life as well as student government. In 2008, Amanda was crowned Miss U of M Flint during her senior year of undergrad. In 2011, just before she completed her master's degree, Amanda got a job with Great Lakes Bay Health Center, working as a health educator in the school-based health centers at Saginaw High and Arthur Hill. She spent 10 years working with young people in the high school, and this became her passion. While at the school, her students won won over $15,000 in various contests, including the Futures Without Violence Respect Video Challenge. Amanda was also recognized twice nationally for her work in the schools with an Emerging Leaders Award in 2017 and a Rising Star Award in 2018. Amanda loves young people and watching them grow and, and mature and being part of that process. In December of 2018, she gave birth to her first son, James, and in November 2019, she had her second son, Jacob. After having her children, Amanda decided to start a new career journey that allowed her more flexibility to care for her children. She now works remotely for Molino Healthcare as a community engagement specialist. Although she misses working with young people daily, Amanda still gets to be an active part of the Saginaw community and beyond and gets to support various community-based organizations, schools, and faith-based organizations. In 2021, she also joined Women of Colors organization. 
Woohoo! And was recently elected as the board secretary. Her life mission is to be the hands and the feet of Jesus wherever he leads. Amanda. Well, hi everyone. Good evening. Um, thank you so much for having me. I feel like that was a huge act to follow with Takaira's story. I really appreciated everything that you shared and a lot of what you shared um, resonated with me. Go Blue also. Um, I did go to U of M Flint, um, but um, I'm super excited to be here this evening. And when Miss Evelyn asked me to speak, I honestly, um, had to think for a long time and say, well, I don't know what I've overcame necessarily that is worth telling. Like, what is my story that is worth telling? And so I kind of just made a list of some things that maybe throughout my life that I've gone through or just um, kind of how my life journey brought me to Saginaw. Um, like she mentioned, I was born and raised in Flushing, which is a little suburb of um, Flint. Not a lot of diversity, not a lot of... Um, really need or difference. And um, ever since I was little, I've always had known that that's not where I belonged or that's not um, where my heart necessarily was. Um, I always knew that I was different or had a different mindset than the people that I grew up with. Um, I was always kind of pushing the limits as um, anybody that was close to me growing up would say. Um, I, from the time I was little, I was someone who always spoke their mind. My grandpa used to call me his chatterbox because I never stopped talking. <laughs> um, and probably a lot of people that know me would agree with that statement. Um, when I was in high school, I um, I was an athlete. I was also a cheerleader, which you can debate if that's ath an athlete or not. But um, my junior year, I played ball baseball my entire life and we didn't have a girls team. And so finally I just said, you know what? I'm signing up for the boys team. Um, I want to play too. And so I signed up and um, I went to a small um, kind of Baptist school and they're pretty conservative. And I was pleasantly surprised that they let me join the boys team because that was kind of a big deal. There was a couple um, kids that their um, parents wouldn't let them play because I was on the team and I was female and I was wearing the baseball pants and everything. And um, so that was a big deal, but it was, um, it was a lot of fun. I think because of who I am, I've, I've always been kind of girly, but also an athlete. And so I would get out there and people weren't expecting a lot from me, but I did pretty well. Um, and so I kind of shocked a lot of people and, um, that kind of mentality of life kind of just stuck with me. When I went to U of M Flint, um, I, that was new to me. I graduated high school with 19 people and so going to a university of thousands of people was kind of a big shock but it was exactly what i needed um i got to meet all different people from all over the world and kind of learn people's stories and um i really like to just sit and kind of listen to people and hear what they've gone through and um how i can learn to be a better human or be better in this world because of um maybe hearing some of those things. Um, I joined a sorority and um, was super involved in campus for the four years that I was there. Um, I ended up kind of changing the um, Greek life culture at U of M Flint. We were able to um, gain a lot of money and things while I was there. Um, and then my senior year, my sorority, right before I graduated, um, our, you know, it was a group of women and it was young women and their um, this, there was a lot of cattiness that went along with that. And um, one of the young ladies that was in our sorority was being targeted. She um, she had a daughter when she was 18 and it never was a problem until they didn't like her. And then they started attacking her for being a single mom and things. And I, I really stood up for that. And that ended up and I spoke out about um, how they were treating her. And that actually ended up costing me. I got removed from our sorority. I got kicked out of the sorority right before I graduated. Um, and so that was really hard for me. Um, I don't regret that. I don't regret um, standing up for what I believed was right. But I um, 
um, it just, it changed some things for me. I was president of Greek life at the time, and obviously I couldn't continue to hold that title um, when I wasn't part of Greek life. So it was, um, it kind of took me a step back because I um, used those connections, you know, and I wanted to continue being a part of that. And I was um, really questioning why, um, you know, why God would allow something like that to happen when I thought, you know, this might be my path moving forward. Um, and so I, I did get some, Evelyn mentioned that I was Miss U of M. Flint. So right after I got kicked out of my sorority, I was in the Mr. and Miss U of M. Flint pageant, which I ended up um, winning. I apologize. My one-year-old's trying to talk on this too. So I don't know if you guys can hear him. Um, I'll move away. So that happened right before I graduated. Um, similar to what Takira said, I got a bachelor's and I was like, I'm not really sure what I want to do with my life yet. Um, my bachelor's is in human biology and I decided very early on I didn't really like blood and guts. Um, and so I didn't want to go into the medical field in that way. And so I went and got a master's degree um, at U of M. And while I was there, I discovered public health. Um, that's something I'd been doing for years through Greek life and through student life um, at U of M Flint. I just never realized that was something I could do a whole career out of. I just thought it was something you did as a volunteer um, to serve the community. And so um, while I was in grad school, I um, I loved being in the Flint community. I loved, um, I worked with um, Children's Miracle Network at Hurley and um, some other organizations. And I just knew that's where I was going to be forever. I knew that um, I was going to get my master's and I was going to work downtown Flint at some really great organization and do all these great things. And so as I got closer to finishing my degree, I was applying at all these jobs and didn't hear a peep from anybody. And I'm, you know, okay, I'm not going to go get another master's <laughs> if I um, I know what I want to do, but I just couldn't um, connect anywhere in the Flint community. And right before I was done, I um, took an HIV AIDS course and um, Deidre Verdunhurst, who um, was the hearth home of Saginaw's manager at the time, was my professor. Um, and I knew her husband. He wasn't her husband yet, but I knew him um, pretty well because he ran our student life department at U of M Flint. And so after um, I had her course, she said, hey, we have a job opening at the Hearth Home, which is Great Lakes Bay Health Center's um, HIV prevention agency. Um, they do testing and treatment. Well, shameless plug for them. Um, and They do testing and um, prefer to treatment, I should say, for HIV. And so I applied for that position. Um, you know, I had the person who was one of the hiring people told me to apply and I didn't get the job. And so I thought, you know, I was, I felt defeated again, like, okay, I, I'm about done with my degree. It's time, you know, I'm looking for something. And then she called me about a month later and said, we have the perfect position for you. Um, and that was the position I held at the school. So, um, the same people interviewed me again for um, the school-based health center health educator position, um, and that was in December of 2010. And um, at the end of my interview, so Angela Williams was my um, director at the school-based health center, and at the end of my interview, she hugged me. And so I called my best friend afterwards, and I said, um, the lady who interviewed me just hugged me, so I think I got the job. Um, have you ever been hugged in an interview? And she's like, no. Um, and so a couple of days later, you know, I got the call um, that they offered me the position. Um, meanwhile, mind you, I had never been to Saginaw, really. I mean, I'd spent lots of time in the Flint community, but I've never been to Saginaw a day in my life. Um, I've been maybe to SVSU a couple of times, but I don't consider that um, Saginaw, like in the city or anything. And so um, on January the 3rd of 2011, I started at the schools and I just really, um, I started at Saginaw High and then um, we had a school-based clinic at Arthur Hill and Saginaw High. And so I worked um, both of those for a, for a year and then we were able to hire a full-time person at Arthur Hill. So I was uh, mostly at Saginaw High, go Trojans. Um, and I really just um, grew to love the students in the community um, at Saginaw High. That was my home. Um, that was my family. We um, And so I just really had a great time um, working with young people and just learning um, their stories. I think the biggest thing for me in whatever 
wherever I'm at in my journey is just um, being able to listen to people and hear um, people's stories, where they come from and um, how I can be a resource or how I can um, help them along their journey, I guess. That's always kind of just been where my heart's at. And um, and so I absolutely loved um, what I did. Um, I was there um, until October of 2020. Um, I was, um, when COVID hit, um, I had just had my second baby. He was maybe about three months old and I was laid off because there's no school. And, um, so that was, um, it was scary at first, especially because I didn't know how I was going to survive with unemployment. I didn't know about, it was before there was, we knew there was going to be any type of bonuses and those types of things. And so, I was thankful for that um, providing and everything. And then um, during that summer when I was laid off, I really um, saw the need to be at home with my children. And it was such a hard decision because I absolutely loved working with young people. And um, I think my favorite part about um, working, especially with teenagers, is just watching them um, develop through their four years of high school. So as freshmen, some of them are timid, some of them are wild still for middle school, you know, and just watching them mature into young people and being a part of that journey and giving them opportunities to grow and learn and just be a resource for them and um, be somebody that can be a safe, trusted adult for them is um what I love most about working with young people, um, I've had the opportunity while I was there to take young people to Lansing every year and speak with our legislators. And um, they don't let me do any talking. They said, sit down, Miss Amanda, we got this. And just watching them um, speak to our elected officials about um, the work that we do in the school in the school based health centers, as well as um, the work that they did in their schools was just awesome to be a part of and I feel so honored to have been a part of so many young people's lives and um, I still see um, students at the grocery store or in the community or I saw one of my um, favorite families I went I had all their kids I saw their grandmother at the grocery store the other day and I went up and gave her a big hug and um, I just um, am so thankful to have been um, kind of embraced in this community. And I feel like this is home now. Um, and so um, when I decided to, you know, step out and leave, it was hard. I cried the last two weeks I was at the school and there's no kids at the school because they didn't go back until March of 2021. Um, but I just knew this was such a big part of my life and it was my family. And so it was very, it was really hard for me to um, decide to leave. And so um I joined the Molina Healthcare Community Engagement Team in the fall of 2020, and um, what became really neat really quickly was that I get to continue to work in the community. Um, most of my role is connecting with community-based organizations and um, connecting them to resources and um, giving um supporting the great work that they do. And so I know that it was definitely a God thing to allow me to um, stay connected in the community that I love, but also um, this is a remote position even when we're not in a pandemic. And so um, I get to also be at home and watch my kids grow up. And so um, I'm really thankful for that. And um, that's kind of my journey of where I am now. I think um, when I think about, okay, how did I overcome these different things? Um, you know, a lot of the things that I do, I, I feel like each season of my life that I've gone through something challenging, I've gone through, you know, whether it's a death in the family or whether it's um, my, and I, I could talk a whole different day about this, but um, my brother um, struggled with substance abuse for some years or the different things that I've gone through that were hard for me. Um, I, a lot of times I connect with um, music. I like gospel music. I like um, connecting with those positive messages and I just um, keep those things. Sometimes I play the same song on repeat a hundred times just because that message, keeping that and knowing that, um, you know, standing on the promises of God. I know there is a verse that I like it says it's Isaiah 54 10. It says, though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. And um, 
that's one that um, there's a few songs that are out right now that kind of um, allude to that verse. And I just, um, I kind of hold to that. I, I had um, my senior year of high school, I had our, fa everybody in the school's favorite teacher had been diagnosed with cancer for the fifth time and he ended up passing away my senior year. And I remember he did a talk with our whole school before he passed and he said, you know, I can't just be thankful for the good things in my life. I have to be give thanks in all things. And um, so he just he he gave us a, a a word picture with that when he spoke. And that's something that's he's he passed away in two thousand four, and almost twenty years later, I had to do math. Um, you know, that's something that his life legacy kind of resonated with me for um, all that time. Is you know, you can't just be you might not want to be thankful for the bad things in your life, but um, looking at, okay, how can I learn and grow from this experience? Or maybe this is a season that's um, going to help somebody else along the line. Maybe I'm going through this so that I can um, be a resource to somebody else. And so, um, you know, I've had not just him, but other, my grandfather, um, he passed the 4th of July in 2018. And my first son, James, is named after him. And he, um, my grandmother, his wife had dementia for probably 15 years because she got it when she was only 61. And um, just watching his positive spirit and how he um, continuously loved on her and um, stayed faithful to her until she took her very last breath. Um, you know, that was an inspiration to me. He um, that was a true testament of unconditional love. I remember the last time he um, spoke to her, we were, you know, say, um, in the hospice and he said, good night, sweetheart. I'll see you tomorrow or I'll see you in heaven. And that was just a true testament to his love for her. And, um, you know, he was somebody who would give you, and my brother and I were just talking about this. I was driving home from an event today and he giving you the shirt off his back is the understatement of the year. He gave you his his shirt, his house, his car, whatever you needed to be better. And that um, that mentality is something that I was, you know, brought up in. And so um, I wouldn't say there's necessarily one thing I've overcome, but I just, um, I think the life experiences that I've had have um, taught me how to how to overcome or how to um, get through tough situations. And then what can I learn from those things to um, maybe help somebody else or connect with somebody else. So thank you for listening to me. Can I go first, Vicky? <laughs> yes, Amanda. Amanda. So I remember visiting Saginaw High, and you were you you were in your glory, and I just watching the kids and how they loved you. I mean, you were at Saginaw High, and I'm like, wow, you know, just to see, see all these African American kids just loving on you like this, and I mean. It was just unbelievable, and I know they miss you. And it's uh, you left a huge void, a huge void. And so it, you just have this beautiful spirit, and you must have adopted some of that from your grandfather, I'm telling you, because. And we, we are just lucky to have you a part of Women of Colors, I tell you. So, uh, yeah, I, I just had to say that. Well, thank you. Yeah, I enjoyed your story, Amanda. It was a great story from beginning to end. And you know what I was thinking as you were talking? Life experiences has a way of teaching us and either pushing us or pulling us backwards. And I'm very thankful that you continue to go forward. No matter how defeated you were in one area, you continue to go forward. You didn't let that stop you. And that's a good thing. If if you find that you know you can't make it this way, you find a different direction to take you along the way to end up where you ultimately want to be. So I think that is absolutely wonderful. Yes, go Trojans because I'm a Trojan. Yes, yeah, I, I like that. I like it, I like it, I like it. So I, I really enjoyed your story. It was a great story. All I hear and I heard from Evelyn when she first told me about you is the kids love her. The kids just love her. She smiles all the time. She has the greatest personality. And I found that to be true. And I'm so glad that you are a part of Women of Colors. I'm very glad you're a part of us. 
Well, thank you. I'm honored to be a part. I've when I first connected, uh, you know, I've known about you all for so long. And when I left the schools, I was like, I need to be connected in some way. And so I called Miss Evelyn. I said, can I join Women of Colors, please? Uh, I know you do great work. And she said, yes, please. So thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I have a question to another question. Amanda, so if you were talking to a young person today, what what's some advice you can tell them right now today with everything's going on with the pandemic and all? What's some words of encouragement that you Ooh. could share? I think just taking it one day at a time and, you know, um, don't let all of these crazy things that are happening in our world um, take away from what your purpose is and your goals in life. And, um, you know, it's hard sometimes because even without a pandemic, our kids go through so much stuff. And, um, you know, just being, I, there's a lot of research even that shows if kids have just one trusted adult in their life, somebody that just listens to them, you know, we want to throw advice at people all the time, but sometimes kids just need someone to say, I'm here and I'm listening and I'm not going to judge you. Um, I'm a safe person to talk to. And I think that's huge for young people because they get talked at all day long. Even when I taught in class, I said, I'm not going to talk at you all day long. We're going to have a discussion. And so, um, you know, I think just validating that they're heard and that they're, they're a person just like anybody else, just because they're young doesn't mean that they don't have value, that they're not important and that they don't deserve the same respect that adults do is huge. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And I apologize for the random children in the background. I've been gone all day, so I just got home like five minutes before. <laughs> I'm just glad to have you home. So there was a question in the chat, and it said, do you think your story has prepared you for your next? Yes, I think, you know, I, I try to... Um, I try to take each experience that I've had and kind of learn from it. And even, you know, I was at the same job for 10 years. And so it was kind of scary going to and, you know, getting part of a, to be part of a new team and making new work friends. And, you know, I call the people like the people that I worked with before my family because they were my family. And so I I think, though, any experience that you go through, you can learn from and you can say, okay, this is the good I'm going to take from it. And this is the stuff maybe I'll do differently in the next uh, phase of life. So that's how I try to um, live my life is how can I learn and grow? And that's how I do things, I guess. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Amanda. Thank, Thank you. you, Amanda. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move just a little bit forward. We've heard some awesome stories so far. We have two, and they have been amazing. I enjoyed everything that they had to say. First, we started out with Takira and Napoleon. Absolutely wonderful. Then we got to Amanda, and hers is even better, as I should say, equally as wonderful. I'll put it that way. Now we're going to move on to another young lady. Her name is Cynthia Hatcher, and I'm going to read just a little bit about Cynthia. Having overcome everything from physical abuse and domestic violence to teen pregnancy, drug and alcohol addiction, Cynthia didn't want to just be free. She wanted to leave a legacy. Those who chose to shrink back in fear and sweep their skeletons under imaginary rugs, she chose to share her world, share hers with the world in a book form. As a motivational speaker, Cynthia Hatcher pushes people to not only tap into the greatness within themselves, but to use the same greatness to leave an impact on their sphere of influence that cannot easily be erased. She wholeheartedly believes that it is her life's purpose and mission to be on the front line, motivating and inspiring others to tap into their giftness and follow their dreams. Affectionately known as the creativity midwife, Cynthia is a coach, a spiritual teacher, an authorpreneur who assists creativities, writes, and entrepreneurs to live in their life 
creative rhythm through her school, the Creative Cave Academy. She is also the founder of the Aspiring Writers Association of America, which their acronyms are A-W-A-O-A. Cynthia is not only committed to helping others create, she is on a mission to birth 60 of her own literary masterpieces by the time she reaches 65. Welcome, Cynthia. Hi, thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to jump right in with my story here. Um, you heard everything that um, she read about me in my bio. That's where I am today, but that's not where this story started, right? That is not where the story started. I was born and raised as an only child um, in a financially stable home. My dad worked for General Motors. My mother worked for the hospital. Uh, I had my own uh, teenage phone. By the time I was 10, I had my own car at the age of 15, almost 16, um, we went to church every Sunday. I mean, I had new clothes. We were a good looking family on the outside, but on the inside, there was another story going on. My father was a child molester and he slept with my mother's sisters and he beat my mother. And that's what was going on on the inside. It's funny because I think about it sometimes how people were probably jealous of what they saw on the outside but they really, really, really didn't know the true story on the inside. Mind you, we went to church every Sunday as well. My father was the Sunday school superintendent. My mother served in church. I served, I sung in the choir, and that's how we looked. Now, um, when I was probably about seven years old, uh, the spirit of God came to me uh, and wooed me to accept. Jesus as savior, right? And so I did. And in my belief as a young child, I just thought uh, accepting this life with God was going to make things better. I, that's what I thought that was going to happen. But in living this life, one way going to church, looking good on the outside and another way at home, my soul was split. It was just split. I wasn't, I had to live two different lives. That's what I had to do. I had to live two different lives. So as soon as the first boy came along and told me I was cute, that was it. You know, I was head over heels. I fell in love and I found myself pregnant at the age of 16. Well, my dad was not having it. I wasn't going to embarrass our family. And so he took me to this place to have an abortion. He took me there and I'm telling you that devastated my life. And when I came home, I was even more rebellious. Uh, I was just rebellious. I, I began smoking marijuana, you know, at a young age and, and I got married young. And after I got married, uh, very young, too young for me, after I got married young, um, I was introduced then uh, to more drugs, you know, uh, they say that marijuana is the gateway drug. Well, that was true for me. It was the gateway drug. And so uh, with sitting around with people who were already uh, smoking weed, cocaine came in and then crack cocaine came in. And maybe the first couple of times I hit it, I wasn't addicted, but it didn't take long. I became addicted to crack cocaine. Now, mind you, after that um, first abortion, after I got married, I was pregnant again. This was right before the cocaine. I was pregnant again and my baby was in my tube. I had an ectopic pregnancy. So I had to have surgery. Now that was two babies gone. I was devastated. So, uh, my getting high began to increase. One morning I woke up and, um, there was blood in the bed. I had a miscarriage. That was my third baby gone. So, Drugs kind of filled that up for me. Now, hear me clearly. I was still going to church. I still showed up at church because I was born and raised in church. So that was the thing to do. I went to church and I was smoking coke. I was smoking crack cocaine. And so as my time was going on, I, I, I knew, though, on the inside of me that I was better than that. 
right? Something was always telling me, and I know that was the spirit of the living God telling me that this is not your way. You're better than this. This is not your way. So I separated and I got into another relationship and lo and behold, um, I continue to keep smoking crack, but I got pregnant again. This is the fourth time that I was pregnant. And I really thought that maybe this was God's way of telling me that I should stop smoking crack. I thought that would be a good idea. So maybe two or three months I would go to treatment, you know, outside, uh, in and out treatment. And um, it just didn't work. It just didn't work. I continued to smoke crack cocaine throughout my pregnancy. I was five and a half months when I began to feel this pain that I had never felt before. And I knew something was wrong. And when I went to the hospital, they told me I had preeclampsia. And the only way to save my life was to take this baby out of me. So I thought for sure that I was going to lose another baby. Well, my baby came out and she weighed a pound and four ounces. She was so small. She laid up on top of a diaper. Now you may think that would be enough for me to stop smoking crack, but I have to be real with you. I was so happy. She was on the outside of me that now I could smoke crack and not feel guilty. She stayed in the hospital four months and four days. When they sent her home, she was four pounds and 13 ounces. And I had promised myself that this was going to be it. You know, I have a baby now. I have to be responsible. I need to stop smoking crack. But guess what? I didn't. Um, at that time, um, and this is only to give God glory. This is only to give God glory. Uh, at that time, after I had my baby, that's when they started taking children away because people were smoking crack cocaine. It had became an uh, epidemic at that time. But I thank God I had had my baby and she was home with me. So as time went on, I kept smoking, I kept smoking. And finally, it was in February uh, of 1995 or somewhere. No, I'm sorry. It was in December of 1994. I was sitting at home. Uh, it was around Christmas time. And my heart wanted to give my daughter a big Christmas. Being the only child, I was raised with big Christmases. I was told Santa Claus came. There was toys all over the place. And I wanted to raise my daughter the same way. But being a drug addict, I only managed to get a, um, excuse me, I only managed to get a real Christmas tree, a real Christmas tree. And I was able to place it up against the wall because I did not have a stand for it. There was no lights, no decorations, no presents. Nothing was under the tree. And as I sat on the floor and began to cry, uh, the enemy of my soul was telling me, why don't you just jump out of the window and kill yourself? Why don't you just end it all? Um, you're no good for your baby. You're ashamed for your mom, your family. Why don't you just end it all? I cried out to the only God I knew for help. I cried out for help. I took my baby to my mama the next day and I checked into a treatment center. Now, I only stayed three days. And I was told by the therapist there that they had never seen anybody come in for three days and leave and be OK. They were trying to send me away to a um, a year long treatment or a 30 day treatment or just a just a program to be away for a while. But I knew I couldn't do it because it wasn't my mother's responsibility to raise my daughter. So I came home after three days. Um, I continued to get high a couple of times and. But then one time in February, I got high again in February of 1995. And the next day I went back to the meeting. See, they had told me, you need to go to these AA meetings, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous. You need to go to these meetings. So in between time, I was going to these meetings and they were telling me to just keep coming back, just keep coming back. So I um, 
got high that last time and it was February the 4th. So my clean date is February the 5th of 1995. I have been clean from drugs and alcohol for over 28 years now. And this baby, let me tell you about this baby. This Saturday, she will be 31 years old. She is um, going to school now to get her degree and she's doing absolutely wonderful. I'm telling you, God works miracles. Now I got off drugs and alcohol, right? But there was still this void in my life because I really didn't understand having a relationship with God. I understood going to church, but that's about all that I had was going to church. And so with this other void in my life, I began to put something else there. And that was sex. So I began to go from one addiction to another addiction, right? Until one night. I called out to God and I was like, I cannot live like this anymore. I don't like the way I'm feeling anymore about myself. This, this cannot be pleasing. I don't like this. So I decided to go on a sex fast. Y'all hear me? I decided to go on a sex fast. Now I was going to these meetings and at these meetings, I would sit and talk to people about how to stay clean. I had about two years clean at this time, and I was in the treatment program, and I saw this fine young man, and I mean, he was fine. And he was sitting there, but I thought to myself, he's not going to make it. He's not paying any attention. So I met this young man in January of 1996. By December of 1996, I was his wife and we are still married today. He is a man of God. I'm telling you, God is absolutely wonderful. He is absolutely awesome. I had to keep surrendering my life to God. The question is, how did you overcome? I had to keep surrendering my life to God. I had to stay real. I had to stay around people who knew how to live better than me. So I continued to go to Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous, and be around people who knew how to stay off drugs and alcohol because I had no idea. After about three or four years in there, God called me out. He said, no more. I don't want you in there anymore. I want you to come out here and do another thing. And so I came out, I surrendered to God on another level. And I am telling you that we have all been given gifts. We have all been given gifts. And after getting off of drugs and alcohol and after laying those addictions down, my gift began to arise. And I wanted to tell my story to my daughter. I wanted her to know the truth of my story. So I wrote a book entitled The Abuser's Daughter. I wrote that book, I think it was 1995, 96, somewhere along in there. I wrote that book. Uh, no, I'm sorry. This is about 1990, 2004. I'm sorry. Let me speak this up. 2004. I wrote that first book after being married for a while and my daughter raising up. I wrote that book in 2004. And uh, I didn't know writing that first book was going to open my world up. See, what I found out is that you keep you have to keep saying yes to God. You have to keep saying yes to God and you have to keep saying yes to your calling. Yes, to your calling. So I wrote that first book. People were asking me, well, how do you write a book? How do you write a book? Well, ding, ding, ding. I had that entrepreneurial spirit on me when I was 21 years old. My dream then was to put Hallmark out of business. That's what I thought I was going to do. So I began these workshops to teach people how to write books. That opened up into a publishing company. That opened up into a national writers association. So now I have published over 1200 people. I have this national writers association. Uh, I have a creative cave school that I've opened up. This is the second school I founded. I also founded the school of the evangelist. Now I'm not saying anything about who I am. I'm giving God all the glory for everything he's done. You heard me say, I kept saying yes to God. And I'm encouraging anybody who's been, who's on here or watching now or watching later. If you're struggling in any place in your life from domestic violence to a single motherhood or anything, keep saying yes to God. 
Just keep saying yes. Spend time alone with yourself. See what the spirit is saying to you and give yourself a chance. Just give yourself a chance. I am super excited about what God is doing in my life. I'm super excited about what God will do in your life and what he is doing in your life. So I am going to be finished talking now. I can talk all day about the glory of God, but just thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for letting me share. Wow. I can just say, wow. I was so amazed at your story. Oh my God. It's amazing. Okay. So I was just thinking as you were talking and thoughts were just running through my head and you know what? I definitely. We are praising God for all that he has done and is doing and will continue to do in your life. He's doing a great work. Now let's go back to the beginning when you started and you talked about your dad. You talked about your dad yeah. being uh, a sex offender. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And then, so you also talked about how the whole entire family pretty much was hiding behind a mask. Yes. Because people from the outside only saw the pretty things. Here was the, the young person that is an only child that seemed to be getting everything. The father's working at GM, so money's coming in the house. I imagine everything looked so pretty on the outside. Mm -hmm. It's like baking a beautiful cake, frosting it up on the outside. It's all beautiful, but the inside is undone. Right? Yes, correct. So this is amazing. So you moved on from that. You you started with all other kinds of struggles. You went into the drug scene. You got into the alcohol scene. You talked about going into the rehab facilities. But yet, even though you went into these rehab facilities, your mind completely was not made up to give up the drugs or the alcohol. Correct. Because it was an addiction for you. And understanding that people that are addicted to these different substances, it is not an easy thing to just give up. But you do have to have a made up mind yes. to want to do better. And I thank God that somewhere deep down inside, you had that made up mind that mm -hmm. you wanted to do more, that you needed more out of your life. So yes. your story is absolutely amazing. And I'm thanking God that he did not let your past yes. defer you or, you know, determine your future. Am I yes. right? Yes, yes. It's all oh, your story is amazing. I loved every single moment of it. I love the way that the Lord has led you in a different direction. Now mm -hmm. you can be that person that tells another person exactly how to make it through this and how to make it through that. You can stand there and say, hey, I've been there. I've done that. I know where you are. I know mm -hmm. that also God can meet you just yeah. where you are. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely true. I have to give God all the glory. You know, people will say, well, you've done this and you've done that. I I have a life goal of writing 60 books by the time I'm 65. I'm on book number 32 right now because it's my gifting, but it's still glory to God, right? I wouldn't even know how to put a sentence together if it wasn't for him. So glory to God. Yes, absolutely. A wonderful story. In your bio, it says you are affectionately known as creativity midwife. What does that mean? That means I assist writers, entrepreneurs, and other creatives to stop counting themselves out. Give yourself a chance. Uh, open up. Use your gift and make money off of it as well. And what would you say to a person that says, well, you know, I have a story within me. I just mm -hmm. don't know how to get that story out. And I just don't know how to go forward to get that story published. What is it that I need to do? What steps would I need to take? Well, first things first, um, I would say uh, write down everything you're thinking about, whatever that topic is. You don't have to necessarily have a title, but say if you want to write the story of your life or how to ride a bike. You're going to write down everything you know about that, right? You're going to take notes as well to the side so you can remember some other things. Because as you're writing, uh, ideas are going to pop up. So you're going to have a notebook to the side. And then there are some awesome people, including myself, that you can get in contact with when you're ready to publish your book. Yes, but 15 minutes a day. 
You don't have to sit down and write an hour a day. Don't feel like this is some kind of pressing thing you have to do. Have fun with it and write about 15 minutes a day. That, that's great information. Great information. And I love the fact that you talked about your, your miscarriages. You had yes. several miscarriages during your time of life. But then God brought forth that last child mm -hmm. and he gave that child life. And now that child, I believe you said was 31 years old. She'll be 31 Saturday. 30, Tomorrow. God, 31 years old. Yes. All of the struggles that you went through, the drug abuse, the alcohol abuse, the losing your children, you know, having miscarriages, but yet God saw fit. Yes. To bring through that child. Yes. And now that child is going to be 31 years old. She, I know you're proud of her and yes. I know she's got to be proud of you. Yes, yes, yes. I'm very proud of her. I helped her start her own business. She was publishing for a while. She's a poet and, a, and an artist herself. So yes, God is amazing. Amazing. Absolutely. <laughs> Cynthia, your story is amazing. Absolutely. I loved every moment of it. And I know you have encouraged anybody who's listening, who's been watching. I know you've encouraged them. You've done a magnificent job. And I don't know if Evelyn has something she wanted to say. I don't want to take up all the time talking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I do. I, I want to say I did her publishing class. And I enjoyed it. I learned a lot. So if anybody's interested in, in attending one of her classes, Cynthia, uh, can you share? I don't know how... Um, if it's an email address or a website where people can go, can you share that? Yes, my email. Say it, say it slow so that people can get it. Okay. My email address is my name, Cynthia at CynthiaLHatcher.com. So that's right. Cynthia at CynthiaLHatcher.com. That's great. That, and that's thank great. you so much for your transparency. I tell you, everything you shared, and I'm sure the more details, every, everything, everything you're talking about, I mean, it's only so much you can share 20 minutes. But thank you, thank you, thank you. Somebody I know needed to hear this. Absolutely. Somebody thank definitely you. needed to hear what you had to say tonight. You have encouraged and inspired a lot of people. Everybody mm -hmm. that's been on this panel tonight has done an incredible job. Every one of you mm -hmm. have inspired us beyond beliefs. You've given us hope. You've given us direction. You've given us encouragement. It's been a wonderful night. I am so glad that you were a part of How I Overcame women's women of color is how i overcame i'm so happy that you guys were all a part of it you've made this such an incredible night and i just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart thank you so much and I'm thank you everyone this connection is a little bit shaky so i'm going to continue to oh. talk just for a couple minutes here now, even though we're ending tonight, I want you to look forward to our next form that's coming up. And I believe the next one that's coming up is going to be in August. All right. So on August the 27th, we have another form that's coming this way. And it's part two of mental health awareness slash suicide awareness. So everybody that's listening, please be aware that that's coming up next. We're going to take part two. We did part one already, and it was incredible. But yet there's so much more information that we need to get out to everybody. And we want to get that information out. So we're doing our best. And following that, it'll be I'm Still a Man. This is the same format for men where they're going to be telling their struggles and how they overcame as well. So we've got quite a few things that are coming your direction, coming your way. And we're so glad that you are a part of us and that you're listening to the things that Women of Colors is doing. We are simply... Loving our community from the inside out. All right. And I'll turn that back over to Evelyn. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Okay. I want to thank everyone who joined us and we hope you we hope you enjoyed this and you learned something. And the panelists, uh Takela and Amanda. And Cynthia, thank you so much for how you came. 
And I would like to express my sincere appreciation to everyone that joined us this evening. Um, and then just everyone, just if you can just go to WTLZKiss.com and the survey, complete the survey. Okay, so Evelyn's, Evelyn is a little bit shaky there. So what she's saying, if you could please join in taking that survey, we really need you to take that survey. It helps us to gauge what more you want to hear, how we're doing. You would take that survey for us and make sure that you submit that survey for us. We enjoyed you tonight. You have been a great great panel and we thank you so much for allowing for us we thank you so much for coming on to be on our panel tonight we appreciate you being transparent and standing in your total truth so from women of colors our president evelyn mcgovern the vice president myself no we're having a yeah, problem here we are thanking you so very much and thank you very much have a good night thank you Thank you. Oh, and Alpha Media. Thank you. She is trying to thank all of our formats, Alpha Media as a whole. We have five stations. So thank you so much, Alpha Media, Women of Colors. Thank you so much for being our host tonight. Good night. Is are we off air? No. Oh.